Hey guys, this is an introduction to inequalities. So we'll start with the difference between an inequality and an equality. So when you solve inequalities, you always end up with something that looks like this. Uh, well, you end up with something that's not equal, hence the name inequality. So it might be less than, it might be greater than, it might be less than or equal to, or it might be greater than or equal to, but here's an example of x is less than five. Versus, think about the times where we've solved equations in the past and we got x is equal to five. Well, when we got x is equal to five, x could only be that one number, that was it. So when we solved an equation and we got one solution, we represent it as just x equals five. And we never did this on a number line because it, it doesn't make sense to use a number line to represent just one number. So that's why we never really talked about this, but if we were to use a number line to denote a solution of an equation, we would just put a dot, a solid dot above the five. Above whatever the solution is, we would put a solid dot there. Now, if it's x is less than five. Let's think about how many numbers are less than five. So obviously we can think of four, three, two, one, zero, but all the negative numbers and all the decimal numbers in between them and all the fractions. So every single number you can think of that's less than five would in fact satisfy this inequality. And remember, a solution is simply a number that satisfies the equation or inequality. When you solve an equation, only the number five will satisfy the original equation that gave us this final answer or this final step. However, if you were to plug in four, 4.1, 3.7, pi, e, uh, zero, 2.1, negative 1.5, negative five, negative 30,000, all those numbers, if you were to plug in for x right here, would indeed be less than five that would yield a true statement, and therefore all those numbers would be part of the solution set, which is to say that you have an infinite number of solutions when you solve inequalities. Now that's not to say that when you solve equations, you cannot have an infinite number of solutions. Remember there's a case uh, where you're left with no variables and the uh, statement that you're left with at the very end is just something like three equals three or seven equals seven or zero equals zero. If you're left with a true statement with no variables, then you have an infinite number of solutions as well. But with inequalities, you'll never get just one number as the answer. You always get, well, an infinite number of solutions because an infinite number of numbers will be less than the number five. So that's the difference between all the equations that we've solved so far and the inequalities that we're heading into. And there's a whole bunch of other differences that are going to be introduced soon. So the different kinds of, or different types or different kinds of inequalities we're going to see will be less than, which is that symbol, greater than, which is that symbol, less than or equal to. If you have like a little half equal sign fused to the bottom, then it becomes less than or equal to. And if it's uh, facing the other way, then it's greater than or equal to. Now, when we solve inequalities, there are two ways the answers can be represented. One is using an interval and the other is using a graph. So whenever we have less than or greater than in the final answer, so let's say you solve a problem and you're left with, you know, X is less than five, something like this. Well, then we use a certain symbol to denote that it's less than and not less than or equal to on a graph. So whenever we have less than or greater than, essentially the terms that don't have the equal, we use this open circle or hollow dot. Uh, different people call them different things, but essentially it's an open circle or uh, the, it's not filled in. Um, depending on which way the arrows are going, you can also use parentheses. So an open circle, it doesn't matter. The arrow can go to the left or the arrow can go to the right. But if you use parentheses, if the arrow is going to the right, well, then you open parentheses here. And if the arrow is going to go to the left, well, then you close parentheses and then you draw the arrow going to the left. Uh, vice versa, if we have less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, we denote that by using a solid dot. 
and then we use brackets. So if it's if the arrow is going to the left, we use a bracket opening or we close the bracket. And if the arrow is going to the right, we open a bracket. Here's an example of how we can see uh, this inequality or this answer represented as a graph and as an interval. So if you solve a problem and at the end you're left with x is greater than or equal to 3, well then you put a solid dot, you make a number line, you just put a 3 on the bottom because we don't care about the other numbers, we just care about this number. So you stick a 3 on the bottom. Now because it's greater than or equal to, because it has that equal sign, we include 3. And what that really means is, if I were to plug in numbers here, so let's say I plug in 4, 4 is greater than 3, 4, 4 is greater than or equal to 3. That's a true statement. That means 4 is in the solution set, or 4 is a solution. Now if I were to pick 5 or 6 or 7, all those numbers would make this condition true, therefore all these numbers to the right of 3 would be in the solution set. But what about the number 3 itself? So if I were to plug in 3 here, 3 is greater than or equal to 3. That's actually a true statement because 3 is equal to 3 and we have an or in the middle. So one of them has to be true, not both of them. It's not greater than and equal to. Well, that wouldn't make any sense. Then that, you know, How many things would be greater than and equal to a certain number? So because it's greater than or equal to, either the number has to be greater than or it has to be equal. It does not have to be both. In fact, it cannot be both. So 3 actually satisfies this inequality as well, versus if we were to go back to this and plug in 5 here, the number itself, that's the number on the number line, 5 is less than 5. That's not a true statement. So 5 would not be in the solution set. Therefore, we would exclude 5. And that's what the open circle essentially denotes. A closed circle means you include this number in the solution set. That's why if 5 is the solution, we want to include it and we just have the dot. If we come down here, x is greater than or equal to 3, well all the numbers to the right of 3 are obviously greater than 3, but 3 itself is also equal to 3. So we have to include 3 and everything else all the way to the right. Another way to denote this is just to write a bracket opening to the right and then make an arrow going to the right hand side. And the way we represent either of these graphs, either of them are going to be fine for me. Either of them are used, uh, both of them are used in fact in mathematics. So it's not like one is correct versus the other. Uh, math instructors, even when you go on into college algebra or pre-calculus or whatever it is you decide to take next, uh, your instructors will recognize both these symbols. The way we write this as an interval is we always read number lines from left to right. So I walk on the number line until I start my arrow. So my arrow starts right here. Is 3 included? 3 is included. So I put a square bracket here and I write 3. And then I keep walking until the arrow stops. So the arrow continues on forever and forever until I get to positive infinity. So I stop at infinity. Infinities are too large to contain in an interval. We can never include infinity or negative infinity. That's why we always use parentheses. So brackets imply inclusion, and then parentheses imply exclusion. Let's look at a couple more examples. So let's say we have x is less than or equal to 5. So because it's less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, we use a solid dot. And then one thing I want you to, to notice is that all these arrows are always going in the same direction as the symbol. So this is less than, the arrow is going to the left. This is greater than, the arrow is going to the right. This is greater than, the arrow is going to the right. Or greater than or equal to, arrow is going to the right. This is a terrible, terrible, terrible way of learning this. So I'm pointing it out so that you guys don't do it this way. The way, the only foolproof way, and this is something we're going to need to use again in the future, so you're better off learning it now, of determining which way the arrow goes is to pick a test value. So in order for me to know that this arrow is going to the right, I can pick a number, any number I want, but it cannot be 3. So let's say I pick 0. So 0 is to the left of 3 on this number line, and I plug it in. That's my test value. 
zero is greater than or equal to three. Is that true? Hopefully you're shaking your head and saying, no, that's not true. Zero is in fact less than three. Well, think about people that lie to you in your lives. Do you want to spend more time with them or do you want to spend more time with people that tell you the truth? So again, assuming uh, normal relationships, you want to run away from things that are false. So you want to run away from the zero. So that's why zero is on the left. Away from the zero means the arrow has got to go on the right. Now this is always going to work 100% of the time. So let's say we pick another number. This time let's pick something to the right of three. Let's say we pick seven and we plug in seven. Seven is greater than or equal to three. That's a true statement, that makes sense. Seven is greater than three. Well, we wanna to run towards the truth. Well, seven is to the right of three on the number line, so we run towards the truth. So that's how you can determine, and I'll give you an example of how this breaks down later as well, but hopefully this makes a little bit more sense. Let's see if we can do the same sort of analysis here. Uh, we know it's less than or equal to, so we have a solid dot and five is going to be included in this interval. Let's pick a test value. Let's say pick, we pick seven. Seven is to the right of five. Is seven less than or equal to five? No, it's not. It's greater than five. So we do not run towards seven because it lied to us. We run, <coughs> excuse me. We run away from seven to the left because that's the way for the truth. And again, if you're trying to convince yourself that that's the right direction to go into, pick a number to the left of five, say three. Three is less than or equal to five. That makes sense, that's a true statement. So we run towards three, or we run towards the side that makes things true. So instead of the solid dot, we could have also used the bracket. And again, when we write an interval for this, we start all the way from the left, and we start walking. So all the way to the left is negative infinity and that is covered by this arrow because this goes all the way down. So from negative infinity, if we start, we continue until we don't have the solution set anymore. So we stop at five. Now is five included or excluded? And again, this is not something you should be memorizing. If you're lost at this stage or if you're not confident, just plug five in, see what happens. Five is less than or equal to five. That's a true statement. So five can be plugged in to this inequality and we can get a true statement out of it. So five would be included, meaning we would use brackets. Uh, similarly, if we have X is less than four, well, we have an open circle over four. And in order to know whether the line goes to the left or to the right, I always pick zero if I can. So if this number that I'm, I'm looking at is not zero, I always pick zero because it makes my life a lot easier. Is zero less than four? Yes, it is. So the arrow is gonna go towards zero, meaning towards the left. And instead of the open circle, we could have also used a, a closed parentheses with the arrow going in the same direction. So both of these are fine. You don't have to draw both of them. I'm just giving you options uh, so that if you see something on a quiz or if you see something on a test, you're not left wondering, hey, what does this symbol mean? And again, we read number lines from left to right. So if we start here, hey, we're at negative infinity. So we start at negative infinity and then we continue until we get to four. However, four is excluded from the solution set. And what that means is if I were to plug in four in here, four is less than four, that's a false statement. That does not make any sense. So I have to exclude it, or I have to use parentheses. Parentheses imply exclusion, brackets imply inclusion. And then finally, if we look at X is greater than negative two, again, stick negative two on a number line, and let's say we pick zero again. Zero is a nice number. Zero is greater than negative two. That's a true statement. I'd rather have no money in my bank account instead of owing the bank $2 and paying overdraft fees. So zero is to the right of negative two, so my arrow goes in that direction. And because it's greater than, it's an open circle, and I have to exclude it. So again, we read number lines from left to right, so we start right here at negative two, but negative two is excluded, so we throw it away. And then we keep walking until we get to infinity. That's our interval. So again, here's a note. Always read number lines from left to right. 
And here's something that I mentioned earlier, and now I'll give you an example of that, to never follow the direction of the inequality. This is a very easy way to make mistakes. Meaning, for instance, if I have five is less than X. Now, if you were to say, oh, less than means I'm gonna have an arrow going to the left, that would be wrong. And I'll prove it to you. Pick a number to the left of five. Let's say we pick four. Let's plug it in. Five is less than four. That doesn't make any sense. Five is not less than four. Five is greater than four, which is why this is wrong. So again, the only sure shot way of knowing how to do this correctly without guessing or without having to memorize additional caveats is to plug in a test value. That's all you have to do. Any number you want, as long as it's not the number that's on the number line. I always pick zero again because it's easier and it makes my calculations easy. So plug zero or some test value into the inequality and then run away from the lies and run towards the truth. So let's say I pick zero. Five is less than zero. That's false. And zero is to the left of five. So I'm going to run away from it. So I'm going to go to the right. And again, if we think about it, let's say we had picked something on the right hand side, just to be super duper sure. If we pick say seven, five is less than seven. That's a true statement. That means all the numbers to the right of five will satisfy this inequality. So again, uh, what I would like for you to memorize here, or not memorize, but truly understand is not to follow the direction of this symbol. Do not follow the direction of the inequality because half the time you'll be right. For instance, all these examples face the same way, but what happens if X is on the other side of the inequality? So if I were to rewrite the inequality to where the X is not on the left, but the X is on the right, then your answers are gonna be completely wrong because you'll be going in the wrong direction. So even though this inequality points to the left, the true, uh, the answer or the solution is actually with the arrow going to the right. So now that we have basically the fundamentals under our belt, let's see how we can solve inequalities. We solve them the exact same way as we solve equations, but there's one important difference that you have to keep in mind. When we multiply or divide both sides by a negative number, I forgot to mention that here. So I would pause the video and maybe just write down both sides. When multiplying or dividing both sides by a negative number, the direction of the inequality must get flipped. So what I mean by that is, if you have say negative three X is less than four, well, in order to solve for X, I would need to divide both sides or divide this negative three over to the other side. When I do, I have to change the less than to a greater than. And vice versa, if I have negative x over two, I'm dividing by this negative two. In order to get rid of this negative two, I would need to multiply the negative two over to the other side. And four times negative two would give negative eight. And again, because this is a greater than or equal to, it would switch to a less than or equal to. So how is it that we can represent this solution as a graph and as an interval? Well, I can make a number line, put negative four thirds on it in the middle. Because it's greater than, or not greater than or equal to, I make an open circle. And how do I know that the arrow is going to the right? Well, I pick a number, I pick zero. I know zero is to the right of negative four thirds. Zero is greater than negative four thirds. Yeah, that's true. Zero is greater than all negative numbers. So my arrow goes towards the truth. Now for this one, I know that it's less than or equal to, I use the different symbol here just to get you guys used to seeing different versions of the same thing. So I could have just used a solid dot, but I wanted to give you some variation here. So let's say I pick zero again. Zero is less than or equal to negative eight. Well, that's not true. Zero is greater than negative eight. We won zero dollars in our bank account over negative eight dollars. So we run away from zero, which is on the right-hand side, and we run to the left. So when it comes time to writing down the interval, all we have to do is imagine we're walking on the number line. So we start walking from the left, and we walk, 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 and we get to here. This number is negative four-thirds, but it's excluded. Because if we were to plug in negative four-thirds, we would not get a true, uh, true statement here. 
So you open parentheses for exclusion, negative four thirds, and you continue all the way until you get to infinity. So that's where you stop. Again, a reminder, infinity and negative infinity always get parentheses, never brackets. For the second equation, or inequality, sorry, we have x is less than or equal to negative eight. So we start walking on the number line, we start at negative infinity, we have an arrow above it, and we go, go, go until we get to negative eight, and then we stop. But negative eight is included, because if I were to plug in negative eight into this inequality, I would get a true statement. True statement means it's included in the solution set. So at this stage, I hope you're starting to see that it's very important to understand both interval notation and the graph. I hope you also see that I always draw my graphs first and then write my intervals. Um, quite frequently, this is not taught in this, uh, I guess, in this manner or going in this direction. But once I draw my number line and I have my graph correct on it, Writing the interval is basically just looking at where the arrow starts and where it ends, always from left to right. So writing down the interval becomes super easy once you have the graph. And it does not take very long to come up with this or even to draw this. So even if the question simply says, write down an interval for the solution, I would very strongly recommend that you draw the graph first and then just look at it and say, okay, well, it starts at negative four thirds and goes to infinity, so that's my interval. So try to get used to writing solutions as both graphs and intervals, not just intervals, not just graphs, but get comfortable with using both. So here's an example of, of something, again, I, I just made it up off the top of my head, so the numbers are kind of wonky, but this is something that, you know, the likes of which you're gonna solve in, in class and on midterms. So let's say we have two minus three X is less than four times the quantity 6x minus 1. And we need to solve this. And we need to represent our answer as a graph and as, a, as an interval. So the first thing we do is we solve it the same exact way as we would an equation. So I can distribute the 4. And if I do that, 4 times 6x gives me 24x. 4 times negative 1 gives me negative 4. And then again, in order to solve this, if it were an equation, we would need to get all the x's on one side and all the numbers on the other side. So what I did here was I took the 24x, which was positive, and I moved it over to the left, making it negative. And I had a plus two here or a positive two here. When I moved it to the right-hand side, it became negative. Now notice these signs or these symbols are not changing direction. They only change direction when I multiply or divide by a negative number. Those are the only two times you have to worry about that. If you're just adding or subtracting or moving terms left or right, you got nothing to worry about. But only when you multiply or divide both sides of an inequality by a negative, the inequality has to flip directions. So negative three X minus 24 X gives us negative 27 X is less than negative four minus two is negative six. And then in order to get x by itself, I need to divide by negative 27 because it's being multiplied here. Now, when I divide the negative 27 over to the other side, I have to change the direction of the inequality because, well, I'm dividing by a negative number, which is one of the two times that I have to change the direction of the inequality. And then if I were to simplify or reduce this fraction by three, or negative three in fact, I would get two over nine. So then my solution becomes x is greater than two over nine. So the first thing I do is I make a number line. I put two over nine on it. And because it's greater than, I just put a circle above it. And then I pick a number. I pick zero, as always. Zero is greater than two over nine. And that doesn't make sense because zero is less than two over nine. And zero is to the left. So I run away from the, from the lies or from the falsehoods. So my arrow goes to the right. And again, if I'm not sure, let's say I pick a number to the right, like 100. Is 100 greater than two over nine? Absolutely, I'd rather have $100 than two over $9, whatever that number is. So I run towards the truth, I run to the right. And when it comes to writing this down as an interval, well, we open parentheses because it's excluded. Two over nine is not greater than two over nine. So we exclude two over nine, 
and we indicate exclusion by using parentheses. So we start at 2 over 9, and we keep walking until we get to infinity. So that's where we stop. Again, a reminder, we always read number lines from left to right. Always the smaller number first and the larger number second. Infinity gets a parenthesis because we can never include it. It's too large. We, we can never get our arms around it. So th this is an example of an inequality that can be the solution of which can be represented as a graph and as an interval. So especially for this particular section or this chapter, you should be very, very comfortable with writing or expressing answers both as inequalities and as graphs. Uh, sorry, your answers both as intervals and as graphs interchangeably. And uh, that's it for an introduction to inequalities. We'll get to compound inequalities in the next lecture.